what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. U.S. health advisors want you to know your health coverage does not have to be complicated. If you aren't happy with your insurance plan, there are unlimited and comprehensive medical plan options available to you right now. U.S. health advisors offer solutions which can't be found anywhere else. They can even offer you the ability to purchase more coverage if and when you need it. U.S. Health Advisors offers fair rates and no surprises. Sounds nice, doesn't it? If you'd like to know more, contact U.S. Health Advisors at 828-554-3032 or by email at daniel.bryant at ushadvisors.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on the Mesh.tv. My name is Alan Jackson, co director and co founder of the Foot Candle Film Society and the annual Foot Candle Film Festival. Chris Fry is with me, also co-director and co-founder of the same two aforementioned organizations. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Welcome to 2020. It is. It's our first show of 2020. So yes. how many vision jokes do we want to throw in or references <laughs> or eyeglasses, I'm, eye charts? The only reference I'm going to do is me saying 2020 like Barbara Walters. I was trying to do that, but I don't know if that came across or not on the You mic. did not. So, no. well, so I failed. <laughs> so I'm just going to I'm just going to leave it at that then. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're kind of expecting the deluge of 2020 jokes to last for quite a while, so uh, we'll see how it turns out. But I love the look of 2020, just 2020. It's cool. It's a a cool-sounding name of a year, you know? I think so. I'm excited about that. And could be an interesting year in films. We'll get into that a little bit later in the show as we preview a few interesting choices of films coming out later this year in our This Could Be Good segment with the question mark at the end and the raised uh, tone there. Uh, but before we do that, this is Foot Candle Films. We're talking movies during the whole show, and we, always, as always, kick off our show with a couple of movie reviews. So that's what we'll be doing today as well. We'll be discussing the f- latest film from director Bong Joon-ho, South Korean director, his film Parasite, that's getting a lot of buzz right now. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to follow that up with a film called Bombshell, directed by Jay Roach. Uh, talking about the uh, group of women taking on Fox News' head, Roger Ailes. Uh, And that film we'll be discussing after we talk about Parasite. After those two reviews, we'll take a short break. I have some news items to discuss. We'll kind of dip into uh, our trailer tapas section, where we kind of feature like a little trailer and just give you a little taste of something coming up in the coming months. And then, as I mentioned, we do have some films to preview for 2020 year as well. I I picked out films, Chris, that are not surefire hits. They're pretty big films in general, but they are ones that I think have a lot of baggage behind them and could be some tough sales. And it's really going to be hit or miss whether they succeed or they could be miserable misfires. We'll take a look and see what we have to look at for the year 2020. Cats 2. <laughs> right, yeah, they're already green lighting the sequel, so that's going to come out fast. Um, <laughs> I don't have a good Cats 2 Riff. I'm trying to think. If I come up with one later in the show, I'll throw it back in there, okay? Fair enough. Um, And then we'll end up the show, like always, with our recommendations, where Chris and I both recommend a film that we think is worth checking out. Uh, Generally speaking, something you can find online or rent online pretty easily. So if you're in the mood for something, uh, a film you need to catch up on or just have some available time, we, we, we have a couple recommendations we think you may want to check out. Mine may take a little longer than just a couple hours, just saying. Give a little highlight. Nice. All right, so Chris, why don't we go ahead and get started with our first review. It is the film Parasite. What? Okay. Oh, I'm going to go to Chris, the latest film from director Bong Joon-ho, he of the fame of 
Okja, which we discussed, uh, I believe, maybe a year before last when it premiered on Netflix. Mm -hmm. The Host, I believe, is a film we talked about also years ago when it came out. I remember watching it for this show. Um, And then Snowpiercer, we also discussed. So we've we've had some history with with, uh, this director on the films coming out. Yes. Parasite, though, comes to us. It's a story about an unemployed family and their particular interest in the wealthy and glamorous Parks family. And as they uh, slowly integrate themselves into their lives, getting untangled along the way in a very unexpected incident. Chris, with this film, Parasite, there's a lot of positive buzz around it right now. I mean, it's been winning awards. It got the best foreign film at the Golden Globes. Right. Won the Cannes Film Festival, the Palme d'Or there. Uh, They're already talking about it could be, and granted, we're recording this before Oscar nominations have come out, uh, definitely will be nominated for Best Foreign Film or Foreign Language, or or, I guess just International Film now is what what they're they're calling calling it. it, But whether or not it could actually be nominated for regular Best Picture, that is something in the mix on the rumor chain out there. Chris, we've seen a progression of this guy's films. We've seen several different genres being explored. You've had science fiction. You've had horror. You've had kind of an odd family and ecosystem, environmental friendly messaging with Okja. This one has its own themes, but also some shared themes that they all seem to have stitched together. In his overall oeuvre so far that we're familiar with, and I'm just going to look at these four films since that's the one we've talked about on the show. Where does Parasite fall and Why? And if you have it higher than the others, what, what is the reason for that? Where, what's the reasoning for placing it where you do in that ranking of Bong Joon and Ho films right now? Um, it's, it's probably Parasite's probably my favorite of the favorite four of the that four you you've had. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's interesting. I think I liked Ocha a great deal. I think I liked it maybe more a little bit more than you, or maybe a lot more than you. I think you liked it a little bit more. I okay. liked it. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting because that film had some subtitles, but a lot of it was in English. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think in a way, I think this being all in Korean, I think helped kind of maybe make the director more comfortable. I don't know, but it's just Mm -hmm. because he didn't have to worry about trying to, I don't know, make it for an American audience or say he did, he was just focused on, Nope, here's my story. Here's my script. And go. he didn't have to worry about the whole language thing. Mm -hmm. Um, which coincidentally he mentioned also at the golden globes when he won the award, he's like, if people can just get over the inch high hurdle of subtitles, there's a whole world of film out there. And he got a lot of buzz for making that statement through his translator. And I, you know, it's really true because this film I think is his best work, you know, of the ones you mentioned and, I, I think it's it tries to do a lot of different things, and I think it's successful in that. There, it's for what it's about. You know, it's a story like a class struggle, and um, has some dark elements to it. But it's pretty funny. It's got some good humor mm-hmm. throughout the film, um, which is not something I was really expecting. Not that Okja didn't have you know some funny parts in it, but Snowpiercer not really, and the host. I mean, maybe a little, but yeah, there was some there was some dark humor in the host for yeah, sure. So, and so, yeah. and some of this humor is dark, but some of it's not. Some of it's just funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was I think that those things kind of help it rise to the top of um, his filmography. Mm-hmm. I will say. Of the ones that I've seen of his work, I think this is probably one of the denser films. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, this is a rare instance where you and I have both had a chance to watch the film twice Mm -hmm. before we came in and recorded. We did. And that helped, I think, not only because of, you know, some subtitles, sometimes you miss things because you're just trying to follow the conversation, Mm -hmm. make sure you know what's going on. But there's so much going on visually that a second viewing, I think, really helped me pull together some things that I didn't know my first viewing. What's your general overall opinion of it? Yeah, I'm there with you. Okay. I loved the film. I liked it a great deal. Um, it is, of the four films I've seen of his, my favorite. Um, I really liked Snowpiercer. That was a film that worked for me pretty well. Ocha was fine. I just thought, I remember really feeling conflicted with the tone of Ocha. Oh, it was just right. okay. going from a, a, a children's E.T. type film to like, a really adult, you know, kind of horrific film at times. Mm-hmm. It just, I could never get the tone right with that film. Snowpiercer, I liked because it was a high concept film. I really appreciated. I need to revisit Snowpiercer yeah. because I remember not liking it as much as no, you. No, I, I really liked it. And then, um, um, you know, beyond that, um, 
Shoot, I'm already drawing a blank on the, the last one the we host? mentioned. The host. Yeah, the host I liked a lot too, but that was my first exposure to even Korean cinema in general, I believe, but just watching that. And I enjoyed it for what it was. I just I think the films have gotten a little bit better as it goes along for the most part. This one, yeah, has is definitely my favorite of his. Um I, I love the fact that it's such a clever story. Mm-hmm. It starts Fairly innocuously. I mean, it starts as just a, hey, and I'll just, I'll just really everything I'm describing is in the first 15 minutes of the film. So sure. I don't feel like we're spoiling no spoilers, anything with yeah. it. But, you know, it starts with the idea of you have a very uh, lower income family living in a very depressed situation. Um, even the the production design around their, where they live being kind of subground where they just have a little sliver of glass where they can see out into the, the street above them. And they're seeing not the... The, the best aspects of life either, you know, people urinating on the street and mm-hmm. fights breaking out, but they have a front row view to that, but in their kind of sub subterranean environment, even the design around all that's pretty, pretty impressive, I think. But it starts with a son from this family taking a job as an English tutor at the parks residence, which is a very upper class family, very wealthy, beautiful, pristine house with two children. And, you know, it's a, it's a job he gets again, the family kind of alludes to the fact that they kind of initiate in, integrate themselves into the park's family through some forms of deception, but also through some earnest work as well. So sure. um, the, I think where it really kind of clicked for me is I was enjoying the film, but then when it decided to take some tonal shifts throughout, uh, never abandoning one of the older tones, just adding on to it. So, you know, you have family drama, you add some comedy to it. You still had comedy through most of the film to some degree. True. It's just you also add on to that. Now there's a horror element. Now there's a thriller element. And then it becomes kind of a very uh, heightened ending. You know, it just it keeps building, I guess, is the thing without abandoning tones and leaving you confused what kind of film it is. Um, I really admired that. You know, I like... I like music that changes as the song goes along or the album's very eclectic, just like I like this film that kind of isn't afraid to jump between genres, but it's still, you never felt like you were watching a different film. It just felt like it was adding on layers to a film that started out simple enough and got a little more complex as it went along. Um, so I really did kind of admire that from it for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that you were saying with Okja, his previous film, you liked it, but kind of the varying in the tones, and it did at times feel like it was different films kind of being put together. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, with this film, I agree. There's several different. There's social commentary. There's comedy. There's family drama. There, but all of them, even though there are plot twists, it never gets to feel like there was a dramatic shift in tone, or there was a dramatic like, wait, where, where's this movie? This could be its own separate movie. No. It all feels part of it's the It's a whole. build. Yes. It's truly building. Right. And just like you would expect with a building premise, I mean, it does get to a very heightened state late in the film, but it's built the whole time. So, I mean, you never, you can't really say you never saw that coming. Right. It's more of a, wow, it just kind of escalates from the very first minute of the film. And uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some other things I liked about it. I think... Uh, I think you mentioned the theme already, kind of this class structure and class societal break. Um, I love the fact that the film explored this idea of different class structures without making any of the classes absolute villains. Okay. I can see in a lesser written hand that the upper class family would be extremely caricaturish, Mm -hmm. very villainous, very, you know, just off putting. And we actually had some moments where there were real connections in this film between the two families. I think there were some 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 level of respect at times. They cared for each other to some degree. It was you know it gets exa- it gets really revealed later on that there's a greater divide than I think they all wanted to admit. But I never walked away feeling like any side is played as a pure villain. Both sides are doing some bad things. And you even get in a grip without spoiling. Sure. There's even a third element to the film that's not as evident right off the bat. And all three of these groups, these elements are, they have their own faults. They have their own way that they've tried to manipulate the system around them or use the people around them for their own gain. So the word parasite as a title definitely kind of has multiple meanings throughout the film as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was something you could admire about it, how there were no easy villains. The one that I kind of would say, I feel like he was maybe the least, there are two, 
that are kind of the least sympathetic characters. Uh, Mr. Park, um, who is the father, like, because at several different points, he makes it a point to tell um, the guy who's playing, you know, the, the father of the other, the mm-hmm. family, that's the, the father of the other family yeah. who acts as a driver. He makes a point to put him in his place. And specifically, sure. like, he has this big thing about not crossing a line. And he mm-hmm. kind of like, he's very abrupt with the way he does it. Sure. So I feel like, but still, I think he's doing things for the love of his family. And you well, can tell certain things he does. But, and then the other one, which I didn't, the other person that I feel like maybe is a little less sympathetic mm-hmm. um, is the daughter from the the family that works together, the daughter that acts as the, the, the art Kim teacher. family. It's yeah, the Kim, the Kim family. family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've got the Kim family, who's the, the ones Park that family. are lower income, and yeah. then there's the Park family. So obviously, Mr. Park's from the Park family, and then from the Kim family, it was the daughter who acts as an art tutor to kind of get in with the Park family. And she, she was definitely more the. She definitely had a lot more experience being devious and being a little more uh, self self uh, uh, focused on her own self. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there again, she does have some. Yeah. I guess I just saw fewer brighter points of her. Personality. She cared about her family. She had a, a deep care for the family, her own family. Um, she seemed to be less willing to want to build any relationships with the other family, where the others did want to have true, some. True, but some there's rel- one point when they're. They are hanging out when the parks aren't there, and they start to kind of talk about the park family. She's like, "Oh, shut up! Don't talk about uh-huh. them. Let's focus on not like." Yeah, granted, she was yeah, drunk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah she <laughs> was. It was well. I think there was a lot of truthfulness on both families that isn't evident until either they're drinking, yeah, or okay. they don't think anybody else is around. Okay, and that's when I think we get a little more of these realizations that yeah. it's not quite the level of respect and appreciation that maybe they've all tried to play off a little bit around each other. So well, the, some of the nuances that happen to not let things be easily one way or the other, uh, the mother from the park family, she immediately, when she meets the young man from the Kim family, that's going to be a translator. She just assigns him a name. Yeah. And she's that's like, really oh. demeaning. Yeah. Well, and then, um, he then does that to his sister, when she's going to become the art tutor, he tells her, oh, well, her name's this. He could have just given the girl her real name or a real Korean name, but instead well, he, he just knew what was going to appeal to the, right. the, the, the woman, though. So he wanted so to make all, it easier for his sister to get a job there. Yeah. And well, then, there's definitely. And but, then the way the mm-hmm. way the daughter who's acting as the art tutor for the camp, or for the Park family, her mother comes in and is working as a housekeeper and when she tries to enter the room where her daughter's being an art tutor, she very <laughs> abruptly you know, treats her very rude, like she's getting a buzz off being able to be demeaning to yeah. the help. Yeah. You know? so, so there's definitely, yeah, I, I think yeah. you see some of those warts and all throughout oh, yeah. the, all the families. And, uh, but, you know, but again, it never got so over the top that I just didn't believe it. I believed sure. all these characters. I oh, believe yeah. they're. Uh, what they're doing, and again, even the upper class family people could easily watch this film and say, "Oh, well, they were just so, so bad and so ugly to the the help." No, I think they were just more oblivious. It's mm-hmm. like they just didn't really think about right. other people's situation. It's not that they were doing and, mean things intentionally. No, right. I don't think they were doing it because it was a power trip or whatever. I think they did just because they just did not think about it. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can't really hate them for that. That's just not the world they're they're used to and have been exposed to. So a lot of themes, a lot of interesting themes brought up in this. Uh, talk about family. It's to talk about class and society. The statement on work. You know, I think somebody brought up a good point in our conversations, at least maybe on one of my, the screening nights I was there, saying that it's funny that, you know, there's so much this lower income family that really has to kind of pull a lot of strings and do some devious things to get these jobs. They're not trying to scam anybody out of money. They're not trying to scam somebody out of things. They're just trying to get jobs. Right. And they were jobs that they were doing. I mean, they were, working, they were working the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like they were sc- screwing around and just trying to stick it to this family. No, they just needed jobs. Right. So you kind of you feel for that. You know, it's like these are people who just need a need a break and they found an opportunity to get a break. So I love the fact that it poses those kind of questions and you can't just come out and say, Oh, that one family was just so bad or whatnot. Does it all justify the ends? You know. I think that's also part of the question is that the, you know, the ends obviously get a little more extreme as we get later in the film and you hate to see it happen to any of them sure. where it goes. But, uh, there's a third element I alluded to that we're not going to spoil into the film that gets mixed in that 
accentuates things and makes things a little bit of a darker and a more uh, uh, concerning situation for yeah. for both families. We'll sure. leave it at that. <laughs> um, I was going to mention uh, the fact, that, uh, just still on the directing, still in kind of the style of the film. Sure, I love the fact that nothing is wasted in this film. Everything's used. Yes. Everything has a part. Everything plays a role. Uh, symbols, a layout of a room, a building, um, comments made just in passing. You realize, I've especially realized after a second viewing, thinking about all the things. I'm like, oh, wow, that I did not realize how that came back. Um, there's a comment, I won't spoil it, but a comment made by the park father. Mm-hmm where he's talking about the housekeeper early in the film. And he says, oh, yeah, she's so good. She's such a good housekeeper. Just she eats a lot, though. And you don't think much about it that first time you hear it. But then as the film goes on, you understand, ah, I get why now that was the case. that comment didn't ring true to me now. Or that didn't, I didn't really think any more about that until what, yeah, now I did. But I won't, I can't say anything because it was something. Little (laughs) things like that. It's like, ah, I love films where they're, they're willing to continue those threads and bring Mm -hmm. it back in and show you how everything was very intentional. I love that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the last thing I'll mention, I want to hear some more from you. Um, uh, the visuals. So yeah, visually striking film so much, both in both environments, you've got the, subterranean house that the, the, uh, the Kim family lives in and the way that's laid out and the kind of the closeness and tightness of that family and, and that structure. Then you've got this big expansive house. That the park family lives in beautifully designed, a lot of sharp lines and sparse layout. Um, got to mention the dark stairway to the basement. I mean, just visually, he has a lot of fun with that visual no, motif. He does. <laughs> so yeah. I love it. It's probably my favorite element of the film visually. I love when they when they show that stairway. And uh and then even the glass on the outside of the big park house, you know, the huge wall of glass looking to the outside world and kind of that division. But also you see a lot of scenes of people looking into the window from outside. I just it was, it was visually very, very, very well done. The flood scene, I'll just say too, mm-hmm. had a lot of visual elements to it that were really uh, impressive. So anything anything more on the film that really stuck out to you on a I positive mean, Everything side? we've talked about, but just kind of feeding a little bit more off the cinematography and the gorgeous shot work they were doing. Um, yeah, there are instances of the family out on the lawn as a thunderstorm's coming and you have the house in the background, this beautiful manicured lawn. Just the framing of that was, you know, beautiful. The shots of the house interior with purposely staged so that you see staircases and the meaning of those staircases and how people are walking up, kind of creeping upstairs or it says a lot. Then reflections of those staircases right before or during the flood that's happening as they leave the park house and go back to the Kim house. And it's just down, 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 down. down. And there's all these staircases with water just flowing over Mm. them. Just, you know, it, it says a lot. And then, you know, usually I'm, can be very averse to bookends. I've complained about it in the past on the show. Um, but the the, fr- the shots that frame the basement apartment's window in the opening and the closing mm-hmm. of this film is just, it's, it's masterful. It's really well done. And I'll say, without giving anything away, there again, one of my favorite things about the film was there's kind of a, there's a sequence that comes at the conclusion of the film that could lead you to believe one thing. Mm -hmm. And I think in an American film probably would be that and kind of would have ended there. But instead it kind of returns to a shot of a character saying something and you're like, okay. Yeah. Basically the last shot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, And and that's where it needed to end. And that's where you're so thankful it did instead of, I will admit I was nervous (laughs) with this coda ending. Sure. Because it does start to go down a path where I'm starting to ask a lot of questions. Right. And I was so happy to see the final shot that just kind of put it back into focus for us and reminded us of what kind of story we're really watching here. Yeah. And that was really impressive. All right, Chris, I love this film. Okay. It's very possibly going to be one of my top films of the year. Actually, I'm pretty confident it will be somewhere in that top five. But I've got one last thing to say about it. So we've we've been really positive about the film, and I'm going to continue being positive to anybody I talk to. Okay. There's one issue. Okay. One thing that just sticks at me a little bit, and mm-hmm. you can probably talk me out of it, but I'm just going to say it. Okay. So 
going back to the coda, the after the what you could really conceive, people are going to call the conclusion of the film, the big end scene that people are going to be talking about. Okay. There is another five minutes or so after that, you know, that continue and tell us what happened after that scene. Um, it was, um, I'm going to do this without getting too spoilery. That whole coda depends on an emotional relationship between two characters. The family. You didn't buy it. Huh? You didn't buy it. Well, I didn't understand why those two in particular, when I saw the entire group as equally connected with one another. So I guess what it is is that I there think, was. You know, I think the reason I would say that it worked for me and I buy it, first time I saw this stuff, well, yeah, that I buy it is because. There's instances between the two characters where they mention plans, yep. and that is several yeah, times right. throughout the film. Yeah. And so I think that that is yeah. why it really. I just I I kind of got a, a, a equally or even greater relationships kind of built up for me between you know the two parents earlier in the film, and I felt like well okay I guess the shifting of focus to the relationship between these two could have came across to me as a little jarring. For the coda to be based on that. Hmm. That's it. Yeah. So it was Don't a little that. tough where I kind of had to readjust my focus with the coda and be like, huh, okay, so I guess the relationship between these two is stronger than I was kind of picking up on from the rest of the film. Because I thought all their relationships is fairly equal. Um, hmm. That, and it was, a, it, was, it was a really long letter to share and communicate through the method that somebody does. I'm just going to say oh that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> really long. Oh my gosh. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. It's really long, Chris. I mean, not gonna, okay. I'm not going to dignify can't, that We can't response. say more about it, but I'm just going to say it was my only, if I had to give some nitpicking little misgiving, it's Whew. just that little bit. Might have cost it a fraction of a star on a rating for me, and that's it. So that's I'll it. say, you know, summary for me is the story, the plot twist, the social commentary, the music, the editing, the acting, the direction, the cinematography, mm-hmm. This is probably my best picture of 2019. Okay, good. So it just really, it, I really don't have any misgivings about it. So for that reason, yeah, it kind of has to float to the top. All right. So, well, I, it's up there for me as well. So I, I, I don't know exactly where it falls yet. I got to kind of do my number crunching and calculations and plotting and vision <laughs> boards and everything do else I do. Yeah, everything. my spreadsheets yeah. I calculate yeah. for the end of the year. Awesome. But you know, it's definitely going to be up there. I really uh, thoroughly appreciated and enjoyed the film. It was a film I was really looking forward to seeing the second time. Gotcha. So that tells you anything with that. Good. Sure. I think we're both on the same page with that. So awesome. Let's move on to our second review, Chris, which is the film Bombshell. You have to adopt the mentality of an Irish street cop. The world is a bad place. People are lazy morons. Minorities are criminals. Sex is sick but interesting. Ask yourself what would scare my grandmother or piss off my grandfather. And that's a Fox story. Oh, it makes so much sense. Women are everywhere. We're letting them play golf and tennis now. HR's on the phone because you called me a skirt. Yeah, it's, yeah. I got to read that manual again. <laughs> the attitude off camera was even worse. You're a man hater. Director J. Rich's bombshell is a drama based on the accounts of several women at Fox News who set out to expose CEO Roger Ailes for sexual harassment. The film stars Charlize Theron as Fox anchor Megyn Kelly, Nicole Kidman as Fox anchor Gretchen Carlson, John Lithgow as Roger Ailes, and Margot Robbie as a newly hired employee named Kayla. How did this film work for you, Alan? Did its exploration of the events provide an interesting and informative look at one of the big Me Too lawsuits? Or did you find the film more of a bomb than a bombshell? Well, nicely done. Um, It's more of a miss than a hit. So I would say more bomb than whatever the opposite of a bomb is. <laughs> I don't know what the opposite of a bomb is, but sure. Um, not to say it didn't have some a misfired bomb, a mis- poorly yeah, aimed bomb, a, <laughs> yeah, a faulty bomb. Right. Sure. Um, I, uh, there are elements of this film I really liked and I'm happy to share them and talk about them. Uh, I like ultimately the story it's trying to tell. I think it's an important story. And I will say that some of the acting I thought was really pretty good. But I think the biggest challenge this film had, and we'll get into it as we get a little de- more detail, I'm sure, is that the fact is it's it's trying to follow really what amounts to three different storylines. And I don't feel like any of the three get due service at all. Mm. And it makes for I – I understand how the three are related. 
I understand why you want to kind of bring them together, but the way this film is fragmented and I think a little sloppy on the writing and it's never got as in depth into any of them because it was spreading itself so thin over this broader topic. So, uh, you know, I think there's elements I like, there's elements I can call it as, as some positives of the film, but overall it didn't work for me because of that muddied spreading out, trying to cover too many storylines and too many characters that ultimately didn't give you a great, uh, a, a really good analysis of this situation. So that's me. What about you? Yeah. I, I'm, I think you are maybe more positive on this film than I am, but some of the things that you are saying that did not work and did work for you performances, uh, Charlie Theron and Nicole Kidman for me, they worked, they were excellent. Actually, it was kind of odd because Charlie Theron almost wasn't recognizable to me. Um, I thought she was great. Yeah, I thought she Megan was great Kelly. too. Yeah, um, yeah. But like the way they did her makeup and her hair, hair. she just really looked completely it was different. Kind of eerie in a way. I it never was. saw Charlie Theron in there at all. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of interesting. And Nicole Kidman, they kind of did some interesting stuff with her hair and makeup too. Mm. Um, made her more of a plain Jane in a way, and kind mm. of like a hard to get along with. But like I don't know, it was an interesting slant that they gave to her character. I thought she was good. Um, and for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Um, which I could see some people saying worse. Um, John Lithgow is Roger Ailes. Um, I feel like he was playing the part and being this, you know, obnoxious monster, which he acknowledges at one point in the film, like people say I'm job of the hut or like, you know, he mm-hmm. kind of calls that out, but it works for the movie. Um, could it yeah. have been a little bit more nuanced? Yeah. But I think it was like, you know, he's fine as playing the all consuming, you know, demon. The things the one you mentioned the different story threads. So we have Megan Kelly and Gretchen Carlson, kind of their stories being told. And the third one for me that was trying to be told that really just didn't work at all was Margot Roby and her character of the new hired employee, Kayla. Kayla. Mm-hmm. That was, it was well, terrible. Let, and the service that they played to diversity by trying to have Kate McKinnon come in there and yeah. show her the ropes. And then like, it I agree just with you. Bordered on offensive, actually, kind of to me. Like they were, I don't know, like stereotyping in ways that I don't think they meant to, but yet, yeah, I don't know. Well, and unfortunately, I mean, that whole storyline, I completely agree. I, I, I understand why they were trying to work it in there because they needed to have somebody being the new girl that was experiencing what other veteran just women there. Well no, it was not. It was really pretty bad. And, <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the part they had, they wrote. So that's a fictional storyline. That was not a real character. So the shame of it is that you've got two compelling stories. I'll tell you right away. I think Gretchen Carlson's story is worthy of a movie in itself. True. Okay. Megan Kelly's story was kind of peripherally involved. And I think she just got a lot more screen time because she's a very recognizable person. Because she and interacted the performance. with Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. the Margot Robbie, though, I understand what it was there for, but it did not need to be a storyline carry throughout the movie. Show us a brand new Fox News employee coming in and the interaction she has with Roger Ailes. Okay, that tells me enough in one scene. I don't need to follow this character and whatever their sexual life is outside of the workplace and – Anything else going on that made no impact on the film whatsoever. Okay. So, I think you know Gretchen Carlson has an, an interesting story, I mean, and that to me was worthy of a movie. But instead, she gets you know less than quarter of the screen time in this film. You never really dig deep enough in any of these. Well, and, I thought, and you're spending too much time with a fictional character that just really had no bearing on the story at all. And I think something else to me that was interesting that they had in there but didn't really take advantage of was the angle of the Murdoch family who owns Fox News. Oh, that and was so slightly Rupert handled, Murdoch, yeah. played by Malcolm McDowell. That was an interesting thing, like their perceptions of what's happening and actually some of the political leanings of the Murdoch family mm-hmm. was not, yes, some of them are conservative, but some of them are not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and kind of like that was kind of interesting. And, yeah, it just totally gets lost. And oh, yeah. I think, like you're saying, it could have, if they had dropped the Kayla story, that would have helped if they had maybe chosen to focus just on Gretchen Carlson yes. and used, you know, the story. Megan, of Megan Kelly, Kelly could have been a supporting a little, thing. Yeah, just because a again, bit. Megan Kelly's role in this whole Me Too thing 
didn't really take shape in the film until like the last 30 minutes. Right. Up until then, it's really about the whole Donald Trump thing, which had nothing to do with the rest of the story, which is an interesting side story about her. Right. And yeah, I thought the whole um, the, the Fox business or Fox you know, ownership uh, with the Murdochs was really interesting. The Gretchen Carlson story could have been a full story. Megyn Kelly could have been kind of a, a side character in that drama. And then you've got, and it really exposes the Ailes Murdoch relationship a lot more. But instead, we spent more time on, you know, um, uh, Kayla, which again yeah. just didn't add anything to the overall mix. So, it did, it didn't. now I thought saying Margaret Ruby was bad. I think no. with the role she was given, I thought she did pretty good with it. But Agreed. it was a very superficial written role, I thought, and it just, uh, you know, it just didn't work. We didn't need it. There was some interesting work that they tried to do, but didn't quite. There again, there wasn't enough meat on the bone for the role to work out. But Connie Britton doing Beth Ailes, yeah, who was the wife of Roger Ailes, kind of an interesting her kind of perception of what was going on and how she supports her husband, and mm -hmm. and that just really wasn't fleshed out enough. No, everything was so surface. So I thought this film had a real tone issue. It seemed like when it started out, it wanted to be The Big Short, okay? The Big That's Short— That's an interesting point of comparison. Well, because The Big Short, you know, kind of was going to take a very serious topic and portray it in a little lighter way with a lot of breaking the fourth wall and all that. This film started doing that, and mm -hmm. I thought, okay, they're going to try to make a little— a little more comic view of this Me Too situation. Totally what the trailer does that we play. Oh, the trailer. Yeah. And then Megyn Kelly's characters breaking the fourth wall, talking to us and saying, well, this is what's going on here. And this is this person, that person. It was very much a mimic of the big short. And I thought, well, okay, if that's what they're going to do, fine. I'm along for the ride on that. But then that kind of gets abandoned about halfway through the film and it turns into a very standard boilerplate. Let's just detail and tell everybody about the situation. Um, I will admit, I, I thought there was a little dramatic tension late in the film when the when the lawsuit was really kind of getting ramped up and all. And but it also was very disconnected. There was a point where nobody from Fox was on board with it, and and Gretchen Carlson was kind of on her own. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, everybody's in it. It's just it missed a huge opportunity to build some real drama sure. and. It just seemed like it was more checking the boxes. Well, we got to show this scene. We got to show this scene. We got to show this. But there was no connective tissue letting us know how things were really building right. like it did. So, yeah, I thought music was interesting. I liked the music in general. The incidental music was a little jarring, a little more unique. It was nice. I thought the acting overall was, was good, you know, from people. And I love the fact that they're tackling this, this subject. I just thought the storytelling was just really haphazard and – Week and you know the Kayla role just really brought everything down. Uh, it kind of got to a grinding halt when she came on stage. Nothing with Margot Robbie, just her character. I'm like, oh, we're back to this storyline now. Like I don't really get the point. Exposition yeah. that we all kind of know, unless you grew up and like you, you know, you were too young to remember this happening a couple of years ago. But this is R rated. Why would you be watching it? <laughs> so, but it's like we don't need the exposition of oh, this is Fox News. It's like if we were watching this movie. 40 years from now, you'd be like, oh, this is how a newsroom was run in here. But these people are so current. Yeah. I mean, you know. Do that, you not feel like the film, and just again, this is me just re-editing it and putting it together story-wise in my head. Do you not feel like this film would have been extremely effective if you had taken the one scene that I actually found thought was directed pretty well, which was the interview scene between Roger Ailes and Kayla? Mm -hmm. If that was the first scene of the movie and we never saw Kayla again. And then the whole rest of the movie is Gretchen Carlson basically having been at this place for now 10 plus years, recounting her experiences over the years. And it's all her story. Megyn Kelly's involved because she does help kind of bring some investigative light to it. But that's it. Mm. That would have been an interesting film for me. I would have been okay with that. Because I do think that scene was, it was edited and shot really with a lot of tension, a lot of drama. But again, the whole Kayla storyline, by that point, I was already not interested in it. So sure. it didn't work as part of that storyline. So, yeah. Anyway, I just, I think it was a missed opportunity, honestly. I think this is, you got some powerhouse actresses. I, yeah, you got your powerhouse actresses and actors. You've got a really contemporary story that a lot of people have some interest in, in a movement that a lot of people are, are, are really behind. And it just wasted that opportunity with a lot of 
weak storylines and haphazard writing and inconsistent tone. So that's just me. Yeah. I kind of the summary of my thoughts is I felt like you'd mentioned you threw out the big short and this film to me kind of felt like it was trying too hard and kind of preaching to the choir um, with very little revelations that were presented as far as like preaching to the choir, as far as like, you know, how this is wrong and Mm -hmm. um, similar to vice in that way, you mentioned the big Mm -hmm. short, but I'll say like, you know, vice kind of had an agenda about, you know, Dick Cheney and the way that was presented. Both had extremely well edited trailers and they were enticing Mm -hmm. with the music and everything. But when the films actually came out, I found them kind of problematic and had problems with the way they were communicating information. Now, I will say Bombshell was better than Vice. Yes. But not as good as The Good Short. Correct. All three have like political motivations and talking about serious news topics and everything. But I don't know. It just Bombshell just didn't quite. Big Shell, big, big, the Big Short had a tone and a style that it kept consistent it through the consistent. film and it worked. I would agree. Bombshell was kind of all over the place and where uh, Vice was really all over the place. <laughs> Vice was taking the Big Short and it just amplifying everything it was trying to do right. without great results. So, um, you know, I'm not going to say I have a hard time saying it's a bad film because I think there's enough on the acting side in the subject matter to make it at least a passable watch to me, it was just a huge wasted opportunity. Mm. And I think it could have been something so much better. So it's fair. Okay. Well, we will wrap that up. Sounds like we were on the same page again. I probably come out squeaking out a little more positive on it than you did, but um, we're still both feeling like it was a big disappointment. Could have been a lot more and, not as cleanly handled as we would hope the subject matter would have warranted. So, all right. So that's our two reviews. Parasite, we're both very enthusiastic and positive on. Bombshell, we were both let down with and felt like had some issues and missed opportunities. Let's go ahead and we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got some quick news item. We've got some movies that we want to preview for the coming year and talk about for 2020, a trailer to kind of tap into and a story behind that. So some fun stuff still to come along with our recommendations. Stay tuned for the rest of Foot Candle Films. We'll be back in just a moment. Hey, this is Moose from Street Circle Drive. That's the Hickory, North Carolina-centric podcast here on The Mesh. Be sure to check out our show and all the others at themesh.tv. Hello and welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on the TV. Alan Jackson and Chris Fry with the Foot Candle Film Society and Foot Candle Film Festival here with you for the second half of the show. Before we continue on with our news items and trailer and previews of films coming up, just a couple of little housekeeping notes. First off, you are listening to this show on the Mesh uh, Podcast Network. That is T H E M E S H dot TV, the Mesh dot TV. It's where you can find all the shows on the Mesh Network, find uh, back episodes and subscribe links so you can subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, whatever services you choose to use for uh, your podcast needs. So we hope you'll check it out and check out some of the other shows on the network as well. Also, I will say that uh, you know, the Mesh has also got some great advertising opportunities, so if you have an interest or if an organization or business is interested in looking at expanding into a wider market or into a more of a niche audience, such as people who go to see movies or like films, like what the listening to foot candle films are, there are sponsorship opportunities for these shows. Uh, you know, it's, again, reaching a great target audience. It's very low cost for what it is. And even though these episodes come out every two weeks, you know, the, the shows are perpetual. Somebody could easily download today's episode three years from now. And the great thing is that ads could still be present all that time. So do please reach out to us. There's a page on the mesh.tv website, the advertise page where you can learn more, or you can send an email to the address info at the mesh.tv. That's T H E M E S H dot TV. And uh, we hope to see as part of the mesh network in the future. All right, Chris, uh, before we get into kind of our two uh, segments we do in our news section, I did have one quick little news item, only because it's completely related to the uh, reviews we had just earlier. Okay. Okay. Uh, So we talked about Parasite. We both like that movie. It's a good movie. Um, As we are wont to do as a society, when people find something they like, they want to try to do more of it. Hmm. Whether it's sequels, whether it's remakes, whether it's turning a movie into a TV series. Sure. 
And that seems to be what's happening with Parasite, whether we like it or not. A limited series around Parasite, the South Korean film we just discussed in our review that we both really, really liked, Mm -hmm. uh, is in the works at HBO. Now, that statement alone, I have mixed feelings on. A, I don't don't really feel like I need a limited series based off of Mm -hmm. Parasite, but okay. But it is an HBO series, which I will say, HBO tends to have... You liked The Watchmen. Loved Watchmen. Thought Watchmen was a perfect example of what... I would be happy if this turned into, Mm -hmm. as opposed to other shows we've seen on other networks or other places, not fair as well. Um, The film's director, Bong Joon-ho, is going to be involved. So that's a positive. It's a good sign. Okay. Uh, But the other helmer of the show, as we talk about our review of Bombshell and its comparisons to The Big Short, uh, the other co-developer is going to be Adam McKay, who is the director of The Big Short. Also the director of Vice. Also the director of some Will Ferrell comedies back in the day. Step Brothers. And I think uh, it might have been Anchorman as well. So they're both in talks to be executive producers. It has not been announced yet who's going to be uh, you know, directing episodes. Uh, and not even sure yet if it's going to be a just an English remake of Parasite as a limited series or if it's going to be some sort of spinoff. All that information I just threw at you, Chris. Mm -hmm. We just talked about how much we love the movie. What is your gut reaction to this? You know, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting subject matter. I always, you know, typically say, you know, why not just go see the original? Why not? But I will say, you know, it is a foreign film. So to get greater exposure to this idea and to this story... Yeah, you know, English remake, okay. Am I clamoring for it? No. Will I probably see it? Probably not, unless I hear it's really good. You know, if you'd told me they're remaking or they're going to do this thing on Watchmen, I probably would have been like, well, we had a movie, the graphic novel was better, whatever. I don't feel like we need it. But then it was good. So, you know, it's there's definitely material to mine. I would rather just people continue to create original content rather than repurpose things. But, yeah, I'm I mean, with you on that. It could be good. You know, it helps that you're saying Bong Joon-ho is going to be involved with it. Yeah, so he's giving his blessing, executive producer. We don't know if he's going to play a more hands-on role or not. It does encourage me as well that it's they're saying it's a limited series. Yeah. So it's not like they're going to make this several seasons. So well, I'll tell you. So here's my Foot Candle Productions pitch sure. for this series. Okay. okay. Do not do an English language remake of it. Of the, of the movie we saw. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Because I think there's enough elements of that film that are very specific to Korean culture. Not to say that we don't have class system issues in America. We sure. absolutely do. But the story, the way it's told there, and some of the elements of the story, not getting into spoilers, I think are a little more unique to some situations in Korea. Hmm. However, the concept of families in different social status and different income levels that have to feed off each other. Like the idea of a parasite. I think that's a universal theme. I think you could do a limited series where it's almost like little mini stories of different class structure, family issues. That would be interesting. Hmm. I think you could do a lot with that. That's my pitch (laughs) HBO. So call me up. I'm happy to help. Uh, I I hope they don't go the English language route because I just, I, I, uh, yes, you could do it. Yes, I could see writing this as an English story taking place in America or somewhere. But there's something about it. There's just, just enough in it that makes it so special for the country that it's in. Anyway, that's my two cents. Do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, no, kind of what you said. I'll be interested to see what they do with it, but I probably won't run out and see it. But, you know, who knows? It could could be good. Well, I have HBO free thanks to <laughs> the cell go. phone plan I have. So, why not? I'll watch it, but we'll see how it turns out. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Chris, uh, our trailer tapas section of the show, is, uh, where we do this every once in a while in our shows, is we like to talk about trailers. We have a love-hate relationship with trailers. You know, some trailers we feel like are a little too spoilery and kind of give away or set unfair expectations on a film, where others are nice little nuggets, nice little morsels, nice little tapas to kind of tease us for the bigger meal. You've got one to share with us today, if I am correct in saying Yes, and speaking of, you know, <laughs> repurposing original content <laughs> or repurposing kind of, uh, we're going to play a trailer for the movie uh, Downhill. It is a remake of mm. a movie that came out a couple years ago called a foreign language film called Force Majeure. 
This one stars Will Ferrell and Julia Louise Dreyfus. It's directed by Jim Rash and Nat Faxon, who wrote and directed The Way Way Back, and they were the writers on The Descendants, that Alexander Payne movie that came out. The one with George Clooney. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, some girl who got her start on that movie, who now I'm blanking on her name, who was also very good in that movie with George Clooney. Uh, <laughs> play the trailer and maybe I'll remember. <laughs> we'll come back and circle back on that. Okay, but here's the trailer for the film Downhill. Wunderbar. Oh, thank you. The hand in the air. Arms up like this. Huh? Happy family. Please, please look into the camera. Please what just smile. You, guys. He wants poles up again. He wants us to keep doing poles up. I don't know. Just been through a lot lately. My dad passed away. It's a shame. Eight months ago. So we came here. He's still here. He's still here. You lose a parent and the ticking gets louder. Every day is all we have. We have, yep. <sighs> Powerful. Maybe we ski the beast after lunch. I don't think it'll be that challenging. It'll be fine. Is that okay? Yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> It looked like it was going to kill us. For a and moment. the kids were screaming because it felt like we were going to die. Pete? Wow. And I look over at Pete, and he had grabbed his phone. Pete left us. Life's really I didn't leave you to be buried. I'm going to win. I ran to get help. Yes, I'm going to win. Please look what happened. And I choose to survive. I love my family. Every day is all we have. How could I run away in ski boots? What? Can you run in ski boots? Not very well. Boom. Exactly. Regardless, I wouldn't leave my family to die. That's boom. Yes, I am. You have a right to be angry. It's black and white. Well, no, it's black and white. How old are you? 30. Oh. I won't give in. There's only one thing I have to worry about right now. And that's going down. understand why there weren't any warnings posted anywhere. There was a warning. What? Posted at lifts, gondolas, hotel receptions, restaurants, shops, bars, soda machines, toilets. We didn't see any of that. Well. Hmm. The fact that that's coming out on Valentine's Day, too, is is which you would know, viewer or listener, because you weren't viewing. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, we, yeah. we saw the... Trust us, it says, it says Valentine's, Valentine's Day is Day. coming. Yeah. Chris, I, I'll tell you, so there, I had several emotions when I heard about this film, okay. which I just found out about it, like, honestly, two days ago. Oh, and side note, Shailene Woodley was the one that was in uh, Ah, Descendants. Shailene Woodley. Yeah, Very yeah, good. Yeah. Perfect. So good. I really Thank like you for closing actress. the loop on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I heard that they were making a film, an American remake version of Force Majeure, right. I thought, nope, that's no good. Uh, I, I just... Force Majeure was such a niche-focused movie that hung on this one concept and mm-hmm. turned it into a real dramatic situation. I just thought, you know, I, I just don't know how you repeat that. And then to make it an American version, which, again, initially our thoughts mm-hmm. are, well, it's just going to become just a watered-down version of it. And then I heard Will Ferrell. I love Will Ferrell. And I'm anxious for him to kind of have a Eddie Murphy resurgence where he's a little in something bit, yeah. really good. But when I heard Will Ferrell, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> They're going to turn this into just a dumb comedy. I see. I heard Julia Louis dreyfus I'm like, okay, a little better? Because I don't think she does a lot of dumb comedy stuff. No. Her stuff's a little better quality, generally, like the stuff Veep she's Like or something yeah. like that, yeah. What got me excited about this film was, A, the trailer – And then hearing that it was Nat Faxon and Jim Rash doing the writing and directing. I really like their work on The Descendants. Mm -hmm. The Way Way Home was really good. They're not slapstick, lowbrow humor guys. There's something more to this film. And I think the trailer confirmed that for me. Yeah, it's going to have some funny stuff, but it's very clever. Well, even just the use of music, the Muse song they played, and just you could tell it's like a building tension thing. That was what was force majeure. It took Mm -hmm. this simple idea of... Guy sees a snow, uh, an avalanche coming towards his family, and he bolts. And they deal with for the next hour and twenty minutes on <laughs> what they do about that information. Right, and it seems like they're sticking to that with this film. Yeah. So now, Will Ferrell will probably get more 
comedic screen time than maybe the lead father did in the original. And I'm okay with that. But as long as they don't lose sight of the concept sure. and still have it a pretty weighty film. What am, are you yeah, the I'm, same I'm way kind I do? of on board? I think, I think way back, maybe when we did review force majeure, we not long after that found that they were going to do a remake. We're like, Oh, that, I think we, oh, I do remember us saying we may that. We have talked yeah, about yeah. It on news like, Oh, that's a terrible idea. I have to say, based on the trailer, I'm I'm definitely interested. I, I think it I think it could work. I think yeah. it could be semi genius. And the fact it's coming out on Valentine's Day, it's all about a family and a husband yeah. and wife. Yeah. It's- well, plus the fact that Force Majeure is not like a foreign classic that everybody knows and talks about. It was yeah, not it terribly well it seen didn't win here. Golden Globes no. and you know. So for most people watching this, this is going to be a brand new story. Correct. And it brings up a really interesting concept. Force Majeure did it, mm-hmm. and you got to give credit to that film for doing it first. But if this is a chance for a larger audience now to have that same story conversation, that same awkward conversation riding home from the movie <laughs> with your spouse or loved one right. <laughs> about what would happen in that situation, um, then I'm all for it. So I'm, I'm the trailer sold me. I'm on board. Thank okay. you for sharing that. So, so I'm <laughs> very happy with that. So that is downhill. Do we know a date when that's coming out? I just oh, said downhill. Right. Day. So next yeah. uh, February. 2020, I think. Oh, like in a month. I think so, yeah. Wow. Okay, good. Awesome. Cool. So this is now going to shift to a little different type of portion of our show where this is the part where we have some films that we've been made aware of that are under production or maybe scheduled to be released before too long that – we have question marks about there are a lot of things about the films that could be a real disaster, but they could also be good. We don't know yet. And it's kind of early to say, but let's explore some of these films. This is our section. We say this could be good. And it ends with dot, 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 question mark. And that's <laughs> the way you got to read it and say it. Fair okay? enough. So these could be good. Chris, here's four films coming out in 2020. Okay. It's a lot. Um, three of them are ones coming out in December. So okay. there's every so possibility they could get bumped to next year. Okay. But there's one I'm going to mention first that is coming out April 3rd. All right. We've talked a lot about the superhero movie glut from the last several years. There's been a lot of them. I yes. get it. Little backstory, quick backstory. The X-Men franchise had seen its better days, has kind of fallen off the, the wagon in the last five or six years. Um, and it ended very unceremoniously, I think with dark Phoenix, which I never saw. I have not seen it either. And supposedly it was a pretty bad movie. Fox got bought by Disney. Disney's basically just wiping their hands of it and says, okay, you guys are done. If we do anything with X-Men later on, we're going to, we'll do something different. Sure. However, there was one movie made stuck out there in limbo land. Okay. That never saw the light of day. Called the New Mutants. Are you familiar with this? I just saw my first teaser trailer the other day because I guess you know, the April release, and I was like, "Oh, interesting." Well, here's the problem: uh, the first trailer for this movie came out in October 2017. Wow! <laughs> so for two and a half years, it's been in limbo. Supposedly, uh, the film uh, has had four different release dates, all changed. Uh, there have been reshoots. Supposedly when Disney took over Fox, they were not happy with the cut of the film, so they mm. kind of scrapped it or at least put it back into production hiatus. Well, they've come around and finished it. Mm. And according to director Josh Boone, who directed the film The Fault in Our Stars. Oh, yeah, which um, is also Shailene Woodley was in that. So this oh, episode just synergy all tie tying together. All well, Josh Boone has gone on record saying this cut of the film is more in line with his original vision for the film. And it's a horror, more of a horror film for so superheroes. Saying, like, I told you guys, why don't you just let me do well, it? Well, or at least that's what the publicists are sure. now saying. Who knows? Sure. But anyway, it's gone with more of a horror slant. So the New Mutants, for if you're not familiar, line of comics that were part of the X-Men universe for a long time. I think they came out like in their 80s. They were really popular at the time. It was basically young mutants who were being taught to be a team and explore their powers and learn to use their powers. Is it different from the group that we've gotten to know of the source of the films, or is it like their early years? No, No. it's completely different. Okay. Completely different people. Okay. Uh, It was a really popular comic in the mid-'80s or so. Um, It's gotten resurrected lately, but anyway. (laughs) So it's a film that's got a – there's a fan following to this. Okay. Um, And the fact that it stars 
Maisie Williams from uh, Game of Thrones. Okay. It's got Anna Taylor Joy, who we both really like from The Witch. Mm-hmm. We thought she was really good in. Um, I thought she was good in Split. <laughs> Split? No, she was. And she was yeah. in Glass, too, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, <laughs> so she's a good actress that we're really interested in. Charlie Heaton, who uh, you may or may not know from Stranger, Stranger Things. Things yeah. Yep. He plays the older brother. Yeah. So some interesting cast members, young, up and coming actors. Of course, they're now three years older <laughs> than they were when they made it. It's like a time machine. <laughs> right. So I'm curious. Supposedly, this last trailer, I saw it. It was okay. It was like a better. It shows a film that seems to have a vision to it, and mm-hmm. we'll see if it comes together or not. So that is coming out April 3rd. Okay. The New Mutants could be good. Uh, don't know. We'll sure. wait and see. Okay. So let's go ahead and hit the three in, in December, though. Steven Spielberg. I've heard of him. Yes. Last film he did was Ready Player One. Okay. I believe that's correct. I believe you're right. Yeah. I can't think of another film he would have done since then. Okay. Ready Player One. Let's go with that. Okay. Uh, he enough. is doing a remake of a film. Do you know which remake it is? No. Ah, good. Uh, bringing a fresh lens to one of the most well-known musicals. Oh, it's not um, West Side Story, is it? It is West Side Story. Wow. I knew they were going to do a film version, or read a new version of West Side Story. Coming I had out no this idea. December. He was doing it. It is Steven Spielberg. Uh, of course, this is the 1961 adaptation of, uh, you know, um, a stage, I believe. Was not a play that he that they then turned into a it's, film in the Yeah, 60s. I think it was a play first and then they made the um, movie. You know, Natalie Wood. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. just very famous film. Yeah. So this one. That's uh, what all of us watched in high school so we didn't have to read Romeo and Juliet. We're like, uh, yeah, we'll just kind of learn about it through West Side Story. <laughs> yeah. This one is going to be starring Ansel Elgort. Uh, he, uh, Baby Driver fame. Also in Fault in Our Stars. Oh, <laughs> It's just wow. Everything's just interconnected. It is. It is. Okay. So Ansel Elgort is going to be starring and then newcomer. Rachel Zegler Zegler will be his co-lead. She's a newcomer. Fresh new face. I was going to say, I don't know her, but okay. I don't know how this is going to go over. We already are in the midst of the cat's debacle right now, taking a stage play beloved by fans for many, many years, probably past its prime when it should have come out as a film now out as a musical, it's getting savaged and destroyed in the box office. Hmm. West Side Story is a product of its time. This is an it came out back when JFK was president, and it was it's very much the Crips and the Bloods, and just not quite a style we really embrace anymore. I don't feel like I think we have, might have a hard time connecting with the uh, with the, the, the tone now if they're keeping it in that same 1960s view, uh, venue, which I assume they are. Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> so, a little. I'm, it could be good, but I'm. Yeah, I, I'm very leery of it. Plus, has, has Spielberg, Spielberg ever done a musical? Not to my knowledge, but I mean, I'm. You know, I've watched. He's had musical numbers in his films sh- and shot and edited to musical stick, but I'm never a full out straight musical. out musical. Like I'm, I'm curious as to why they wouldn't get somebody who does musicals yeah. you know, to do. Um, yeah, I don't have a good feeling. About uh, that. I don't know. This one's a little iffy. And they're releasing it, you said, in December, so it's like Christmas time and kind of a big to-do. Yeah. Mm. Now, I'd, another musical that I think will work that's mm. coming out uh, is one that Lin-Manuel Miranda, he wrote in the Heights, mm. and that's coming out in 2020. Oh, yeah, that one. But I'm interested to see that because no, it's, it's more it's, current. You know, well, so. and it's the people who actually Correct. put on the stage play, kind of turning it into film. Yeah, that right. totally has a lot of good vibes around it where West Side Story I'm <laughs> hesitant <laughs> hesitant yeah. um, so we'll see okay. it could be good but uh, it could also be pretty bad the fact that Steven Spielberg is involved with it is interesting is that it could be good because he definitely can direct but directing a musical yeah. I don't know it's a mixed bag yeah. a mixed bag agree alright let's go to one that I'm going to go ahead and go on record saying um Excited about, okay. but it's got every potential to be a bomb. Hmm. Dune. Oh. December 18th. Okay. D- uh, Villa, uh, yes. Dennis Villeneuve. Yeah. Uh, doing another sci fi remake, kind of like Blade Runner. Well, well this are, is actually an adaptation. What this, are your hesitations? It is Dune. Oh. And, and Blade Runner 2049 bombed. 
Oh, I don't care. I liked it. Okay, I understand that. But <laughs> so, if we I'm want to see more things like this happen, it has to have some box office vi- viability to it. My thing is that you know, Dune the uh, the original David Lynch version eighty four or the original film version, yeah, uh, huge cult hit, but massive just did not box do. Office uh, it was considered David a failure. Lynch didn't even put his Nobody's name on wanted it. to touch this property for like the last twenty some years because of that. Sure. So here we are almost 30 some years later and you're, you're 35, 36 years later. Um, I love it. And I saw the thing I said, I'm excited about it. I'm just saying, oh, you too. know, will it work or not? We'll have to see. It's a very, it's a dense story. The fact they're putting it out in December is a little odd to me. I yeah. wouldn't think this kind of, unless, I mean, obviously you put it out in December cause it's Oscar buzz, I guess. And there's not a star Wars film. So why not? I think there's a little bit of that. There's no big space epic to kind of compete against, but Dunes are much more heady yeah. content than Star Wars. So December is a tough time to bring it out, to kind of bring in the masses and the families. Um, mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, though. This cast, oh, okay. good gosh, listen to this. Timothy Chalamet. Oh, he's, he's in everything now. Yeah, right? he is. Just I think that's default. kind of a requirement when you make a film. Well, Chalamet's in it, Does right? Does have okay, any <laughs> male uh, under 40? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, Timothy Chalamet, Chalamet. checkbox. Check. Uh, Oscar Isaac. Okay. Zendaya. Okay. Javier Bardem. Wow. Josh Brolin, Rebecca Ferguson, Stel, uh, Stellan Skarsgård, and Jason Momoa. Wow. I mean, that's a pretty crazy cast. Yeah. It's, and already Villeneuve with the, as a director. I'm already sold on no, that. Yeah. I, I thought Blade Runner 2049 was really good. I loved Arrival. Yeah, Arrival was great. Yeah. Uh, Enemy. Mm-hmm. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. So he hasn't done a miss yet in my mm-hmm. book. That's why I'm just afraid the expectations may be built up a little too high by the fan base for this. I, I hope it's good. I really want this to be good. And we'll see. And it would be really nice to have the Dune based on the, uh, you know, the, uh, the 1960s sci-fi novel to actually have a really solid fan pleasing, you know, and, and yeah, sci-fi. Not fan pleasing. Well, not fan pleasing. I say fan of the original <laughs> we'll book. Fan of the books. I mean, okay. people who had the book, they want to see a really good version of the film uh, of the novel put to film, you know? And then there's people like me who've never read the book. I just want a really good science fiction kind of engrossing movie. I mean, this may be blasphemy probably is to the hardcore fans. I've read the book. I didn't think it was that great. Okay. So you're just looking for something I mean, original it, and good. A lot and strong of the with ideas it. were there, but as far as like, yeah. Oh, I want to read it again. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well then we're just looking for a good science fiction movie then. Sure. All right. And Villeneuve is obviously shown us he can do sci-fi. Yeah, uh, without he's, any he's problem. Capable. So he's got a great cast to do it. It's almost like this, this is one of those films that's it's 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 so well set up right now. Mm-hmm. That's what makes me nervous. It's oh. just got too many good things going for it. I hope it can live up to that reputation. Understood. All right. The last one to me is the complete opposite, Chris. This is a film that everything you tell me about this film, I'm just like, ugh. I don't I don't I don't so see you're how thinking, this is gonna work. This could be good. Sound <laughs> Have you heard anything about The Last Duel? No. Okay. You are familiar with, um, I believe, Oscar nominee uh, actor, big name actor, Matt Damon. Yep. Heard him. I believe you're also familiar with a actor and director of winning awards as well, Ben Affleck. Yes. You remember they got their start together, kind of big names for each other with Goodwill Hunting. Yes. Which so, I go on. I, I like that. It's movie. a good movie. I, I like it, it is a good movie. Yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of Mr. Affleck on his own. I have kind of derided him as an actor many, many times. <laughs> I've liked him generally as a director. I wish he'd just direct and mm-hmm. not do anything else. But uh, anyway, he and Matt Damon are have reunited for the first time as screenwriters since doing Good Will Hunting in 1997. Interesting. They have adapted, along with Nicole Hoff, uh, Hall, of, Hall of Center. Yeah. Uh, great director and writer. The 2004 book by Eric Jaeger about the infamous 14th century duel between French knight Jean de Caragos, who's going to be Matt Damon, and his former friend and squire Jacques Legree, who's going to be played by Adam Driver. Jodie Comer, who is in Killing Eve, I know you haven't seen that show, but she's really good in that. She's okay. an up-and-coming actress, plays the nobleman's wife. Ridley Scott's directing. So Ben Affleck just wrote it. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon wrote, wrote it together. Wrote it, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think Ben Affleck is in it, from what I can tell. I don't see his name anywhere in this little credit thing I'm doing. Matt Damon, Adam Driver, Jodie Comer. I love the acting. Ridley Scott's got me a little worried because I'm, oh, I'm sorry, but just I mean. 
Yeah. The last, you know, well, okay, I know you're going to champion uh, Prometheus. Prometheus. Yep, I will. <sighs> but defend, it, I, defend it to the death, I will. But what else uh, director-wise has he done in the last 20 years? Um, Nothing that I was really overly high on. Yeah. I mean, he's made a lot of good films. I still think he can direct. Um, I was, right. you know, even the sequel to Prometheus that they made um, – Alien Covenant. Covenant. Yeah. Um, I liked I liked Covenant okay. Yeah, it was better than I remembered when okay. I revisited it. But, you know, he, he had, yeah, I like Matchstick right. Men. So, you know, it's, I, he's but got But the subject matter, uh, coming he's, on December. He's done a movie about people dueling. I think it was called Duelists. And that was I like one of his it, earliest ones, Harvey right? Harvey Keitel in yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Wasn't a big fan. Um, so, <laughs> interesting that he's returning to it. Um I don't, I don't know. I it's odd. Uh, and there are no trailers, of course. No, it's so. it's slated for December. This is very much one that if they don't feel like mid by mid year that it's coming together and it. it doesn't look good for Oscar season, they're just gonna push it off, I'm afraid. I don't know though. This is I think a tough sell. I mean ugh. Is it gonna be played as a comedy? It doesn't sound like it. I mean, it very well could. It doesn't really talk anything about the the blurb we've gotten doesn't really give you a lot of, about the tone of the film. So, just a very specific historical film. Yeah, um, coming out in December. It's based on a novel. Yes, based okay. on a novel, a two thousand four book, which is kind of interesting. So it's not like it's a you know a more classic novel. This is a two thousand four right. novel about something in the fourth century, a duel. I don't know. It could be good, but I'm not feeling it right now. So we'll see. I, and there'll be one, I think, the trailer and any um, further information will kind of tell us a lot about this. Hmm. So that's the four films I wanted to share. In my books, if you look at those four, I think one is, I hope, will be a, a real win, and that's Dune. You got one that I feel like my prediction is it's going to be a flop, and that's Wet Size Story. <laughs> I think New Mutants is going to be a surprise. I think it's going to go in with nobody expecting it, all the bad uh, production notes about it. It's going to come out being pretty good, and people are going to like it. Last Duel is the one that's a question mark for me. I don't know. It could go either way. Hmm. It could be one of those surprise great films, or it could just be kind of really rough. Ridley Scott still trying to direct a, a period drama written by Damon and Affleck, which, I mean, I don't know them to be people writing period dramas. Hmm. I don't know, okay. but I do like Adam Driver. I, so as do I. Adam Driver seems to be connecting to a lot of good material lately. So yeah. anyway, I took a little longer with that segment, but I just felt like there was a lot to cover. So sure. interesting films coming out in 2020. We have for the year for sure. That's good. Okay. So you ready to go into recommendations then? Let's close the show out here. Yes. Okay. This is the part of the show where Chris and I both share a film that we've either come back into recent contact with or maybe just remembered and felt like it was worth talking about and recommending. It can come from any decade, any time period, any studio, doesn't matter, any format. Uh, just the goal is to try to get something that you as the viewer could actually go out and watch, like here, pretty easily. And we try to stay within that case. I've slipped a few times on mine, but... <laughs> That's only because I was just struggling to find a recommendation for the episode. <laughs> uh, I, I've got one that I can say safely that, yes, people could watch this weekend if they wanted to. Okay. But, Chris, I've been talking the last little bit. Why don't you uh, tell us your recommendation here? So I'm going to recommend a film that came out in 2019. Um, I did hit some theaters. Uh, it's hitting iTunes, I think, into January. So it will be available to screen. Here pretty widely. soon after you listen to this. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is Trey Edward Schultz movie waves. Ah. And so he's the director that did, it comes at night. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and uh, uh, Krishna. Krishna. Mm-hmm. And, uh, both of those were good and both had elements of like family drama and struggle. It comes at night a little bit kind of supernatural post-apocalyptic type thing. But Waves, um, it follows a suburban American family led by a well-intentioned but a little bit domineering father, and they navigate <laughs> they navigate some trauma that comes mm. into their lives. Um, this is an emotionally draining film. Oh. So yeah, Great. but it is <laughs> one to huddle the whole family <laughs> around on a right. Friday night. Great. Right, but it is it is really good. Yeah. Um, and the use of music, it's actually, uh, he's gotten Trent Reznor and Atticus 
is it Ross? Whatever yeah, they, Atticus Ross. Okay. Mm-hmm. So those two are doing the music for this film. Oh, wow. So it's like Trey Edward Schultz kind of hit the gold mine by having these guys do the music because it is it is really well done and fits the movie. Nice. Um, so that's that's a good part. I of did it. not realize they were the one doing the music. That's great. And the the cast they've got two people. Sterling K. Brown plays the dad, but I mean he's he's really good. He's from the TV show This Is Us. I believe Which so. I've never, I haven't I've seen, never it. seen, but okay. I know he's won a lot of acclaim for his performance on that show. So, but it's also got Lucas Hedges and Kelvin Harrison Jr., who is the big guy in Loose. Loose. Yeah. Yes. So um, he just, in my opinion, knocks it out of the park again. So he's good in this in as this well. Movie. Um, so I is, also heard some really positive notes about uh, the, yeah Taylor Russell, mm-hmm. the girl. Yes. So uh, my only experience with her is she is in the uh, Netflix show Lost in Space. Um, oh which is on its second season now. It's a really good show. Hmm. She's good in it. So I was excited to hear that she's actually in a, a feature film and supposedly pretty good. I had forgotten. Yeah. Lost in space. I'd forgotten she was in that. I'd seen a little bit of it, but forgot she was in it. Mm-hmm. So interesting, but it's, it's good. Um, it might be, I would say maybe it's a tiny bit shaggy and uneven, but okay. I think that actually pays dividends to the kind of story they're trying hmm. to tell. So um, it's a tough set, but it, it's a it's a good one. So okay, it's, well, it's on my good. it's on my watch list. There's like three or four films I kind of am really wanting to keep and catch up with. We've got Oscar nominations coming out in a few days. I don't think this one sounds like it's really in the, the yeah, playing at, field right now for at anything. First, when it was first released and it was on the kind of its festival run, yeah. I thought there was going to be some buzz behind it for Oscars, yeah. but I don't. It's think kind of lost some steam the out. last little bit, yeah. but I still want to see it from 2019. So that's yeah. like one of three or four I've got left to see right now. Great. I'm glad to hear you're recommending it. That's uh, even more encouragement for me to go and catch up with it. So, Chris, at this point in the show, you can go in. You can go and leave. I mean, you can shut off your mic and go. There's really <laughs> nothing more for you to listen to here. Okay. Because I'm going to recommend a film that you've already kind of given a, a, a somewhat negative review about. Um, I finally caught up with The Irishman. No, you said people could watch this over the weekend. They need to block off like a week and well, a half. Well, I told them they can watch it for the weekend. Because <laughs> okay. it would three take days. a weekend to watch yeah, it. that's fair. Uh, I have caught up with all three hours and 29 minutes of The Irishman. Um, I get it, Chris. It's a long film. I get it. Uh, you know, watching it in a, uh, prolonged movie experience, the theater experience could be really, really trying because you can't have any coffee because you know, you're yeah. going to have to go However, to the restroom. <laughs> I've watched it and I do think it's really good and I like it a lot. Um, I, Goodfellas is one of my absolute favorite films. And I'm glad I didn't go into this expecting it to be another Goodfellas because it's not, even though a lot of the same players are there and it's about kind of a gang mentality and crime and all. This is a much slower, much more contemplative Martin Scorsese, which at first kind of took me aback. The first 30 minutes of this film, I'll, I'll admit I'm a little struggling because it is very slowly paced. Um, it's taking its time to get places. I completely agree with people's assessment of that. But for me, for three and a half hours, it was enjoyable to watch. I felt like this was Robert De Niro is not back to where he was in the eighties, but it's the best Robert De Niro I've seen in probably 15, 20 years. Um, Al Pacino, again, not at the peak of his game, but better than I've seen him in a while. Now, Joe Pesci, I will say probably the best I've seen him that I can remember. Cause other than Goodfellas, the only dramatic turn of a film I can remember, I can't remember any dramatic turn that Joe Pesci was really good in. I just remember him from home alone and lethal weapon movies. My cousin Vinny. Okay. He was good. But again, that was a comedy him sure. doing a drama. This is the first time I've seen him do a really dramatic role. And I thought he was really good. Actually, he was the one that probably surprised me the most in the film. Um, there are three to four scenes in this film that I still can really look back on and say it was a great scene. And I will say that the ending of the film got me. It, it worked for me. It was not what I expected from the ending of this film, but it worked. Um, the de-aging technology that's gotten a lot of press and kind of a lot of different opinions about it. Uh, I thought it, it was terrible. Okay. It seemed to work for me. I, once I got past it in the first 15 minutes, I was okay with it. I and it never distracted it, you from me. on your laptop. Um, I watched on my TV at home, Netflix. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I watched on a big uh, screen. See, I was going to say, if you watch on your laptop, maybe it didn't look as bad because in the theater, because I did get to see this in a the theater, 
it was really, really distracting. Okay. It, it wasn't distracting for me. I, again, once I, the first 15, 20 minutes, I'll admit, it was rough. It was this whole film was just, okay, this is slow. I'm really noticing the de-aging stuff. I'm not quite sure if I'm digging this or not. It took me a while. Once I got past that first 20, 30 minutes, I really enjoyed the rest of the film. Mm-hmm. Actually, my wife has gone back and watched it, and I've intentionally wanted to sit back and watch certain scenes with her again. So, so she took like two weeks off from work? <laughs> yeah. Well, she was homesick for a couple of days, so okay. it was a perfect time to do it. I, uh, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a good movie. Um, okay. you know, could it have been tighter? Absolutely. Could it have been a lot more effective at 2.40, uh, 2 hours 30, 2 hours 40 minutes? Yes. But I didn't mind it, Um, and I felt like the story it was telling was extremely interesting. It was nice to see a story that was also rooted in some very true historical – I mean, I read about it afterwards, the true Jimmy Hoffa story, and that's what this film's about. It's a mob hitman recalling his his possible involvement with the death of Jimmy Hoffa. And when you read back about the real – how much authenticity there was in this film based on what – This mob guy wrote in his autobiography. It's just an interesting story. So I'm saying The Irishman, if you've heard things that people are saying don't watch it because it's so long or the de-aging stuff is distracting, get past the first 20, 30 minutes is what I'm saying. And I think you'll find yourself rewarded for it. Um, Or you can follow along with what my partner here said and just – Sleep through half of it and not feel like you're missing anything. There is so. some good acting. The the car explosions will wake you up for that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there is a car explosion about every 20 minutes, kind of on cue to wake you up. Right. Um, again, if you're wide awake, you've had your full pot of coffee, I think it's a rewarding experience worth the watch. I'm not big on long movies. I tend to see, I have a tendency to fall asleep a lot in movies at night, so I had to make sure I watched this as much during the day as I could. But I'm, I'm glad I did watch it. I thought it was a really good movie. So I enjoyed it. That's The Irishman for me, and then Chris gave the recommendation of Waves, the Trey Edward Schultz film, that I'm eagerly wanting to see and now have bumped up on my watch list. All right, Chris, we're off to a good start on 2020. That was a pretty full show, a lot to cover. We both were very enthusiastic about Parasite. We both were let down and disappointed with Bombshell, Um, although I tend to find a few more positive things on it. Parasite, I'll also say, if we're looking at rating scale, you're probably an inch above me, but both of us are very high at the end of our scales. Okay. Um, uh, We talked about the Parasite limited series coming to HBO. We talked about the uh, trailer for the film Downhill, which is a remake of Force Majeure that we're both now curious about and intrigued by. And then we hit four films that are coming up in 2020 and are uh, responses to those uh, potentially good or completely potential misfire films through the rest of the year. So with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. Chris, I'm sure people have opinions. People have now got to pick a side on the Irishman debate, <laughs> pro Chris or pro Allen on Irishman, um, because there's not a lot of disagreement throughout the rest of the show, it sounded like. But the Irishman sounds like our kind of big split right now. If anybody has some opinions or thoughts that they want to share with us, how, how can they reach out to us? So you can send us an email at info at the mesh dot TV. You can side with Alan on the Irishman, or you can spout off various thoughts about Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> this is the episode well. post Skywalker review, and we're yeah. still kind of smarting from that one. So, right. So yeah. it, was, it was tough. But uh, yeah, send us an email at info at the mesh dot TV. If you send an email and you want to make sure I read it, make sure it takes longer than three hours to read it. If it takes longer, <laughs> if it's shorter than three hours, Chris will probably read it. Just know the length of the uh, email is going to have a lot to do with who reads it. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to remind you that the Candle Film Festival will be September 23rd through the 27th. We're a ways away from it, but I try to make plans to attend it. It'll be here in Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, also, if you are interested in submitting a film, there's still plenty of time to do that. June 1st will be the cutoff for that. So still plenty of time June to submit. June 1st, 2020 for the 2020 Foot Candle Film Festival Correct. is the cutoff deadline for submissions. So if you're a filmmaker, plan to submit. If you are a film lover, plan to attend. Yeah, so we got you covered either way. That's right. Um, and also, if you know somebody who's a filmmaker and is looking to get some, uh, hopefully, some more eyeballs on their film, uh, please make sure they they hear about the film as the festival as well in our submission day. That's FootCandleFilmFestival.com. That's the website you go to to find a link to submit the film or read more about it and so forth. 
That's a good deal. All right. Well, I think we will wrap it up. Thanks to the mesh.tv for hosting this, this podcast. Again, you can learn more about podcasting and podcasts available through the network at the mesh.tv. And of course, advertisement options too are on the website. If you're interested in bringing a part of our family and helping us spread the word of uh, things we're doing here in Western North Carolina through the mesh network. Chris, uh, we will sign off for now, but we look forward to talking to everybody in the coming weeks about some more films as we get into 2020. Thanks a lot for listening. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.